This conference will now be recorded. Harsha Vardhan, this is your first class, right? Harsha Vardhan, I think I saw someone named Harsha join the meeting. So, in the previous class, we saw a few sources of impurities in pharmaceuticals. We saw that impurities may arise from raw materials which is used in the manufacture, from the method of manufacture, from atmospheric contamination during the manufacturing process, from intermediates which is present in the manufacturing process, manufacturing hazards. So, storage conditions and accidental substitution, I hushed it up a little. So, I thought I will just, uh, you know, explain about it a little bit more in brief. So, storage conditions or it is also called as instability of the product. So, now storage conditions, as I said, now the weather is cool here in Bangalore and now the temperature may be around 25. Okay, so if the storage condition says that it should be around 25, then this is the perfect weather. Now, supposing it says, you know, that the chemicals or the uh, final formulation has to be stored between 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, then obviously you have to keep it in the fridge. So, impurities can arise during storage when the storage conditions are inadequate. If it says to store at 2 to 8 and you're storing at 25, your product will decompose. So this chemical decomposition, it is often catalyzed by light or by traces of acid or alkali, by traces of metallic impurities, air oxidation, carbon dioxide and water vapors. Now this can easily be predicted if you have certain knowledge of the chemical properties and it can also be minimized or avoided by using proper storage procedures and conditions. So can you look at the image? So any substances or you know your medicines which are photosensitive in nature, it can be protected from light by storing them in amber glass bottles or it can also be stored in metal containers. So thereby because of which you can eliminate this source of impurity that is you can eliminate this decomposition of your chemicals so you must have all observed right there are a few uh, syrup bottles which you see some are in plastic containers some are in just you know uh, normal glass containers and some are in this amber glass containers this is because each drug has its own uh, stability issues the same way Materials which are susceptible to oxidation by air or attack by moisture should be stored in sealed containers. Okay, and if necessary, the air from the containers can be displaced by an inert gas such as nitrogen. If you can't replace it by nitrogen, then you can add suitable antioxidants such as ascorbic acid, tocopherol and sodium citrate. Now, the next storage condition issues is when your uh, chemicals or your medicine react with the container material that you are using. So, you can see here now salicylic acid ointment must not be packed in metal tubes. Now, supposing if it is packed in metal tubes, then the reactor will, that is the container material, will react with the drug and cause its decomposition or its instability. The same way, when you are manufacturing plastic, you are using something called as plasticizers. So now this plasticizers, which is present, will leach into your uh, drug or your formulation and cause impurities. So you should choose your container very carefully with respect to your drug or your formulation. Same way, you must have seen all these uh, insulin uh, preparations right they come in a glass bottle with a rubber closure on the top just like the third image which is there 
okay mm -hmm. so these rubber closures are also more susceptible to absorb the medicament so you have to choose which kind of formulation you can use which type of your container material so apart from these two temperature is also very critical for your storage conditions so the rate of chemical decomposition and the physical changes of the stored products depends upon the temperature now you very well know that uh, a few antibiotics you know which is prescribed they come in a powder form and along with that you also get a sterile water for injection which is given with it have you all observed it can anyone tell with certain antibiotics you do get a certain water for injection you have to reconstitute it have you all observed or seen it can someone tell if you have seen yes ma'am so what do you do trisha see i want this class to be as interactive as possible okay so you need to interact even if you don't know you have to unmute yourself and say that you know no ma'am i really don't know can you please tell i'll certainly explain now since trisha said yes ma'am i want her to tell me what it is ma'am i don't know ah uh, then why did you tell yes ma'am okay so your uh, antibiotics you know especially they are very susceptible to light and at the same time their storage conditions that is temperature has to be very low you have to store it somewhere between 2 to 10 degrees centigrade so because of which when it is in a solid form it is stable but when you reconstitute it that is when it is in a liquid form chances are there that it will start decomposing it will start degrading so because of which certain antibiotics when you reconstitute you're supposed to take whatever dosage 5 or 10 ml that is prescribed by the doctor and after that you're supposed to store it in the fridge you're not supposed to freeze it you're supposed to store it in the fridge so when the next dose comes in the night when you have to take you have to take it out just 15 minutes before let it come to room temperature use whatever is the dosage that is 5 or 10 ml and then again you are supposed to keep it back in the fridge this is done so that there is no decomposition or degradation of the medicines so that is why as i said storage conditions is very very important okay so coming to the next source of impurity accidental substitution or deliberate adulteration with spurious or useless materials now all this you know adulteration is not just limited to you you know to your grains or pulses even with medicines also there can be accidental substitution or there can be deliberate adulteration deliberate meaning purposefully you are going to uh Uh, do the adulteration so many pharmaceutical chemicals are adulterated with cheaper substances so now the example they have given here is potassium bromide is a very expensive chemical so this can be mixed with cheaper sodium bromide okay and when they do such kind of adulterations you know sometimes they are very difficult to analyze or control or maintain so such kind of impurities you know that that leads to your impurities potassium bromide is the main chemical that you want but it is also substituted with cheaper sodium bromide so this sodium bromide now is an impurity to your potassium bromide so this way impurities can also be caused by accidental substitution or by deliberate adulteration so to prevent all this you know contamination or all this they have to be stored separately or they have to be stored in a locked cupboard so that they don't mix so now we saw what is impurities we saw what are the sources of impurities so next what you should know is what is the effect of these impurities so the pure substance now as far as we have come and we have seen it is very difficult to get a very pure substance and it is known that it will contain some amount of impurity okay so impurities may have the following effects 
that is impurities may bring about incompatibility with other substances impurities may lower the shelf life of the substances it may cause difficulties during formulations and use sometimes impurities can change the physical and chemical properties of the substances therapeutic effect can be decreased it shows toxic effect after a certain period and it is injurious when it is present above certain limits apart from this it may also change the odor color and the taste of the substance so now what should we do to avoid all these impurities what do you think should be done to avoid all these impurities can someone tell me what can be done can someone tell what can be done are you all there yes ma'am but when you need to respond now that we know what are the sources of impurity and what is the impurity how do we avoid them of course we don't want our medicine effect to go down or we don't want our medicines to show any toxic effects right so how are we going to avoid it okay so to prevent these impurities many tests such as limit tests are carried out so this limit test is done to lower the impurities and to make the pharmaceuticals more safe now you all remember right the issue which happened with maggi didn't we all miss maggi when it went off the shelf don't know ma'am don't you know that maggi was banned in 2015 not yes ma'am yeah ma'am why it was banned do you know why it was banned there were two two reasons as to why it was banned one is they said that they uh, have not added msg that is monosodium glutamate whereas actually when they did test they did find that it was present so it was a very false claim second thing is they had told that the amount of lead which is present in maggi was within the limits but when they tested they found that it was more than the limits that is prescribed by the fda so because of which it was taken off the shelf so the same way there are limit tests for your drugs or for your formulations as well so now what do we mean by limit test so now what is the limit limit is a value or a amount that is likely to be present in a substance so in maggi also when we take the example of maggi lead is bound to be present in maggi but the uh, you know uh, food authorities or the food control had told that only a certain amount let's assume only 10 microgram of lead should be present in maggi but when they tested they found that it was around 50 now that is too much and it can cause adverse effects on people who are consuming it because of which it was banned and it was removed and now if you observe on the maggi packets there is no uh, label claim which says no added msg before it used to be there but now they have removed it because that was a false claim which was proved the same way limit means a value or a amount that is likely to be present in a substance and test means of course to examine or to investigate so therefore you can define limit test as a quantitative or semi quantitative test which is designed to identify and control small quantities of impurity which is likely to be present in the substance so as we saw impurity is bound to be present and there is no compound which is completely 
pure in nature okay so this limit test what it does is basically it identifies the impurity it compares it with a standard so that you can limit its present in the formulation or the drug so how do you do this limit test how do you identify you it involves simple comparisons wherein you are going to compare the color of the standard solution with that of the sample solution or you are going to compare the turbidity which is produced or you are going to compare the opalescence which is produced so it is generally carried out to determine the inorganic impurities which is present in the compound so in short limit test is nothing but to identify the impurities which is present in the substance and you are going to compare it with a standard so the quantity of any one impurity in an official substance is often small and consequently visible reaction will also be very small so now let's say that you know uh, when we take maggie's example i said 10 microgram is the amount of lead that should be present now supposing you have 10.2 micrograms of your lead so now this 0.2 micrograms which is there is a very small quantity and when you are going to do a reaction just to see visibly it is a very very small difference to be identified so therefore the design of the test is important if errors are to be avoided and this can be done by the following three ways one is the test should be specific specificity of the test okay so that it gives a selective reaction with the trace impurity second is the sensitivity okay so this varies according to the standard of purity which is demanded by the monograph next is control of personal error we should see through that while we are carrying out the test we should not make any errors from our side so we will look into all of these three factors when we are dealing with individual limit tests so in your limit tests these are the apparatus that you will be using so can you all look at the image here yes ma'am yes ma'am okay. okay so this is called as your nestler's cylinder okay it is called as your nestler's cylinder okay and it is of two different capacities the one on the left is of 100 ml capacity the other one is of your 50 ml capacity and as you can see there are markings on the nestler's cylinder now this is your nestler's stand okay this looks just like your test tube stand which you have used okay but only thing is the diameter of the holes is bigger in size to accommodate your nestler's cylinder and then what is the other image which is there glass rod yes that is your glass rods this this is also the other two apparatus which you'll be using what is the other what is these two images on this ppt ma'am yes then glass beakers they are not beakers um, cylinder glass cylinders no mm. measuring glass they are called as measuring cylinders okay measuring cylinder okay okay they are called as measuring cylinders so as you can see you can see the mark which is there right all the markings which is there each one is of different capacity so you have you do have a 1000 ml as well okay so this in this image you can see it is 100 ml 50 ml 10 ml and 5 ml okay it does come in varying kya this one mark markations these are the limit tests that you will be studying under this chapter limit test for chlorides limit test for sulfates limit test for arsenic iron and heavy metals so today we will cover limit test for chlorides and sulfates so the first one is limit test for chlorides as you can see the apparatus required just now what we saw we saw nestler cylinder you also need the nestler cylinder stand you need glass rods and you need uh, the chemicals that is required is your dilute nitric acid that is 10 percentage silver nitrate solution which is a 5% solution 
and you also require sodium chloride first we will look at the procedure okay we will see how it is done then we will go into looking what is the principle behind it so this is the procedure so in the images that you saw you saw that there were a pair of two right a nestler cylinder both let it be 100 ml or 50 ml capacity there were two nestler cylinders so you are going to take two 50 ml nestler cylinder for this limit test for chlorides and you are going to label one as test and you are going to label the other as your standard okay so sometimes here in the ppt you may see instead of test i might have used the word sample both is the same test or sample means the same okay so in your test nestler cylinder you are going to take a sample that i am going to give you okay it could be a liquid or it could be a solid sample you are going to transfer that sample into the test nestler cylinder and you are going to add 10 ml of distilled water and you are going to make it soluble okay then you are going to add 1 ml of dilute nitric acid and you are going to make up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water to this later you are going to add 1 ml of your silver nitrate solution mix well and allow to stand for 5 minutes now these two test and standards has to be done simultaneously okay i will tell you the reason as to why it has to be done simultaneously now in your standard nestler cylinder you are going to take 1 ml of standard solution of sodium chloride and then the rest of the steps as you can see it is the same you are going to add 1 ml of dilute nitric acid make up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water add 1 ml of silver nitrate mix well and allow to stand for 5 minutes so basically it is only the first step in both the nestler cylinders it's going to be different in the test you're going to take the sample and add 10 ml of distilled water in the standard you're going to take 1 ml of the standard solution so all this you have to do simultaneously or together you're going to transfer both into your nestler cylinder the rest of the uh, steps you can do simultaneously after you have mixed well and you have allowed it to stand for 5 minutes you're going to compare the turbidity of the test with that of the standard can you all tell me what is turbidity do you know what is turbidity color no it's not color anyone else can you tell me what do you mean by the word turbid i'm not asking for a proper definition something that you can explain to me okay let me show you the image so that you can come to know what is turbid can you all look at this image yes ma'am now this is called as turbidity okay on the far more right you can see it is a clear solution right the fourth bottle has a clear solution right the second one you can see it is slightly turbid in nature you can see that you know some solid particles are there which is suspended in the solvent okay in the second bottle you can see there is more of that solid substance and in the first you can see it's almost cloudy in nature okay the solution is cloudy in nature this cloudy thing is for what is called as your turbidity that is your solid particles are present in the solution and depending upon the amount of the solid particles which is present you will have different turbidity okay this is what is called as turbidity so now what is the principle behind this limit test for chlorides okay so now what happened what did we take in our standard solution standard uh, nestler uh, cylinder can you all recall and tell me what all did we add in that standard nestler cylinder Dis distilled water okay what was the reagent that we used what was the standard solution standard solution of sodium chloride okay then sample sample is in your test yeah test in test only sample 
dilute hno3 now who is that talking your voice is coming very feeble maybe keep your mic a bit near because you are answering correctly but it's very far one ml okay. of dilute hno3 yes dilute nitric acid so now dilute nitric acid is used we have used our sodium fluoride something else we added what was it or 1 ml of silver nitrate yes we added 1 ml of silver nitrate solution in the end after that only we mixed well and we allowed it to stand for 5 okay so what the principle behind this is the reaction takes place between the silver nitrate and the chlorides which is present to obtain silver chlorides which is insoluble in your dilute nitric acid okay so let us look at the reaction okay so in that way i think you'll be more you know you can understand easily so what did we take in a standard nestle cylinder we took sodium chloride solution 1 ml to that we added distilled water then we added 1 ml of dilute nitric acid okay after everything we added 1 ml of our silver nitrate solution mixed well and we allowed it to stand for 5 minutes so when you mix well and allow it to stand for 5 minutes a reaction takes place between your sodium chloride and your silver nitrate so when the reaction takes place you get silver chloride as a precipitate now this silver chloride which is precipitated is insoluble in your dilute nitric acid because of which a turbidity is produced your sodium nitrate which is produced is soluble in your water whereas your silver chloride is not soluble now it is not soluble because you are using your dilute nitric acid now because it is not soluble only you can see that there is turbidity right otherwise it could have been a very clear solution and you can't really tell if there are chlorides which is present now when we look at the sample reaction i can give you any sample you know i can give you tap water we all know right we did see under different types of water that our tap water has chlorides carbonates sulfates phosphates it has everything okay so let's assume i am giving you your tap water and we are going to see whether tap water has chlorides or not okay so tap water definitely does have chloride ion so when that chloride ion is present it will react with your silver nitrate to give you your silver chloride precipitate and your nitrate ion so this silver chloride precipitate or the turbidity that is produced because of this precipitate you are going to compare it with a standard okay let's go back to our maggi example which i gave you right the food authority or the food controller had told that only 10 micrograms of lead should be present right so that is your standard okay they have set up a limit they have set up a value and that value is your standard value okay anything which comes less than that what do you do with that product supposing Ma maggi has a limit of 5 now 5 micrograms so what do you do with that product are you going to release it into the market or are you going to tell no no this has to be still further banned i couldn't hear you prashant further ban ma'am you're going to further ban can you tell me the reason yes. reason i don't know but okay anyone else who want to answer this question it should be in exact limit ma'am no you're wrong so then what is right okay let me tell you let's take that example as as it is okay so the standard value or the standard limit that has been given by the food authority is 10 micrograms right anything less than that you can release the product anything more than that it will be for further investigation until then it will be banned okay that is what happened in maggie's case if it was 10 micrograms was the limit for lead if it is less than that it would have still there been there in market back in 2015 but since the quantity or the amount of lead was more it was banned so until they 
rectified that issue you did not have maggi on the shelves okay so this is what happened back then so the same principle applies here as well okay so the amount of chloride ions which has to be present in a substance there will be a limit which will be specified in the pharmacopoeia if it is less than the limit then the sample or the test is said to pass the limit test so see now as you can see here the sample or the test turbidity is compared with the standard turbidity so the test passes if the turbidity of the sample is less than the standard and it fails if the turbidity of sample is more than the standard did you all understand this or do you want me to explain again come on you need to tell me did you understand or do you want me to explain again no explain again ma'am okay i'll explain with the reaction okay so that it will be easier to understand see now in the standard nestler cylinder we took 1 ml of our standard sodium fluoride solution right to that we added 1 ml of our dilute nitric acid then we added 50 ml of water that is we made up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water later in the last we added 1 ml of our silver nitrate reagent we stirred it and we kept it aside whereas in our sample or our test nestler cylinder we took whatever was the sample that was given to us we added 10 ml of distilled water and made it into a solution to that we added 1 ml of dilute nitric acid and then made up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water later to that we added 1 ml of silver nitrate solution mixed well and kept it aside for 5 minutes now both of this you know uh, especially in your standard nestler cylinder you are bound to get a turbidity turbidity that we saw here let's assume the left one which is highly cloudy in nature is your sample turbidity okay let's label this as your standard okay the rest of the three bottles if they are three different samples then the test is said to be passed the limit test passes for chlorides the reason being the turbidity that is produced in bottles 2 3 and 4 is less than the turbidity that is present in the first bottle and now since the first bottle is a standard and the rest of the turbidity is less than that of the standard it is said that the limit test for chloride passes okay so basically this is what happens here also so the chloride ion which is present in the sample will react with the silver nitrate to produce silver chloride now this silver chloride which is produced in the sample is very very less in quantity because of which the turbidity is also very less whereas in our standard it is fixed we have fixed we have taken exactly 1 ml of standard solution because of which you are going to get the exact amount of silver chloride precipitate which will give you the turbidity okay so this is what is basically the principle behind limit test for chlorides you are just going to compare the turbidity of the standard with respect to the sample or the test okay so this is the principle behind the limit test for chlorides now is it clear did you all understand yes ma'am yashwant did you understand yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so moving on what is the reasons for adding our dilute nitric acid so as i said you know the precipitate of silver chloride which is which you get it is least soluble in dilute nitric acid okay so we want the precipitate to be least soluble right if it is completely soluble then you will not get any turbidity so because of which to make it you know least soluble you are going to add dilute nitric acid that is the first reason second reason being this dilute nitric acid dissolves the unwanted impurities like carbonates sulfates and phosphates so when i took the example of tap water which i said you know it has all your chlorides carbonates sulfates and phosphates now since we are going to do a limit test only for chlorides 
we should see through that the other impurities like carbonates sulfates and phosphates do not interfere with our test so that is the reason you need to add something which will dissolve this unwanted impurities so that you can test only the chlorides okay the third reason why you are adding dilute nitric acid is it provides a common ion effect now next is the precautions that you need to use first precaution is you need to use distilled water only can you tell me why we need to use only distilled water no minerals or impurities, impurities are present impurities yes, are absent yes correct your impurities like your carbonates sulfates chlorides and phosphates will not be present in distilled water whereas in tap water it is bound to be present so that is the reason you have to be very careful that you have to use distilled water only to dissolve and to make up the volume the next precaution is same glass rod should not be used why can you tell me why the same glass rod should not be used okay so when you are using a nestle cylinder no you will be using two different nestle cylinder one is for test and one is for your standard so when you are using glass rod if by mistake you interchange the glass rods you are going to contaminate your test or you are going to contaminate your standard solution so therefore two different glass rods should be used for two different nestle cylinder and they must not be interchanged otherwise this is what is called as your personal errors this this is the error that you are going to do because of which you are going to incorrectly study okay next is next precaution is the silver nitrate which you are using here is photosensitive and it should be stored in amber glass bottle now you all can look at the picture right the hand is completely stained right it has black dots this is because of silver nitrate it oxidizes and it causes staining on your skin now this stain will always be there on the upper layer and it will keep fading over time as you wash your hands so nothing to be alarmed of okay so till now what we saw was the limit test for chlorides okay we'll move on to the next one that is limit test for sulfates so limit test for sulfates and limit test for chlorides has almost the same uh, precautions okay so under limit test for sulfates apparatus required is the same the chemicals required changes so here you are going to use dilute hydrochloric acid and the reagent that you are going to use here is barium sulfate so i am going to again explain the procedure first and then we'll go to the principle so please look at look into the procedure carefully because when i when it comes to principle i am going to ask you so same here you are going to take 250 ml nestle cylinder label one as test and you are going to label the other as your standard so in your test you are going to take your sample whatever i am going to give you it could be a solid or it could be a liquid and you are going to dissolve it in 10 ml of your distilled water to this you are going to add 2 ml of dilute hydrochloric acid then you are going to add 5 ml of barium sulfate reagent and you are going to make up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water you are going to mix well and allow to stand for 5 minutes whereas in the standard you are going to take 1 ml of your potassium sulfate standard solution okay you are going to add 2 ml of dilute hydrochloric acid 5 ml of barium sulfate reagent make up the volume to 50 ml using distilled water again you are going to mix well and allow to stand for 5 minutes so as i said under limit test for chlorides the same applies here as well both has to be done simultaneously otherwise you will not be able to compare the turbidity and after 5 minutes immediately you are supposed to compare the turbidity so you are going to compare the turbidity of the test with respect to the standard okay we'll come to that later now this is the basic principle so now what all did we use can you tell me what all did we use under standard
yes sachin what was the standard solution that we used under standard solution ha ah, which solution sam uh, there was no sodium at all one ml of standard solution and potassium sulfate yes potassium sulfate standard solution 1 ml we took then what else did we add 2 ml of uh, diluted ethyl hydroxide yes correct then barium 5 ml barium as a reagent barium sulfate 5 ml yes, barium sulfate correct and then we added we made up the volume to 50 ml 50 right. yes ma'am right yes correct so now what what is the principle is the reaction takes place between your barium chlor that is your barium sulfate reagent okay barium sulfate reagent your potassium sulfate in the presence of your dilute hcl so when the reaction takes place you get a precipitate of your barium sulfate and you also get potassium chloride now which is soluble in water this barium sulfate is insoluble in your water because of the presence of your dilute hcl right we have used 2 ml of dilute hcl so that the barium sulfate is not soluble in it the same principle applies for your sample reaction let's take tap water itself into the uh, as our uh, test solution so we are going to take tap water which we know has your sulfate ions to that we are going to add the barium sulfate reagent and you are going to add dilute hcl and you are going to make up the volume to 50 ml you are going to get barium sulfate precipitate so you are going to compare the turbidity that is produced in the sample or test with that of the standard now you all must be thinking ma'am is saying in the procedure barium sulfate reagent was used but in the reactions you has put barium chloride what is this okay so let me tell you what it is previously only barium chloride solution was used but now it is replaced by barium sulfate reagent they are telling it as barium sulfate but you are not going to use barium sulfate here per se you are going to use barium chloride which acts as a precipitating agent you are going to use alcohol which prevents super saturation okay you are going to use potassium sulfate which acts as a seeding agent and increases the sensitivity of the reaction and you are going to use water as a solvent or diluent hence the name is given as barium sulfate reagent so because if you say barium chloride solution then you are using only barium chloride but if you are going to use the term barium sulfate reagent so because you are using the term reagent it means to say you are using two or more ingredients okay so this question can come under your two marks question saying you know uh, what is the composition and uses of your barium sulfate reagent so you need to know what is the composition and what are its individual uses okay so in this slide you can see preparation of this barium sulfate reagent how you can prepare so first is you have to prepare 0.05 molar barium chloride solution and that is prepared by dissolving 12 grams of barium chloride hydrate in 100 ml of water so from this solution you are going to take which you have prepared 100 ml of your barium chloride solution from this you are going to take 15 ml into a 100 ml volumetric flask you are going to add 55 ml of water then you are going to add 20 ml of sulfate free alcohol so since you are doing limit test for sulfates whatever alcohol or water you are using it should be free from sulfates otherwise it's going to interfere in your test so you are going to use 20 ml of sulfate free alcohol and 5 ml of your potassium sulfate solution then you are going to make up the volume to 100 ml using distilled water so this is how your barium sulfate reagent is used so as we saw under the composition what all did it had it had barium chloride which you are using 15 ml then it had your alcohol you are using 20 ml of sulfate free alcohol then it had potassium sulfate yes we are using 5 ml of potassium sulfate 
and we are using water as a solvent or diluent yes we are using 55 ml of water so this is what is basically the preparation of your barium sulfate reagent so this is the same you know it's just you are just going to replace a few words from your chlorides to sulfates okay there we saw the reaction was between was between soluble chlorides here you are going to see that the reaction is between soluble sulfates okay and the other difference that you can see is in your limit test for chlorides you use dilute nitric acid here going you are going to use dilute hydrochloric acid what was the reagent that you used in uh, limit test for chlorides what was the reagent we saw under limit test for chlorides what did we use we used silver nitrate right we used silver nitrate there and here we are using barium sulfate reagent okay that is the difference so what is the reasons for adding dilute hcl the reasons is the same as what was there for your limit test for chlorides the precipitate that you get here that is your barium sulfate is least soluble in dilute hcl that is why you are going to use it second your dilute hcl dissolves the unwanted impurities like carbonates chlorides and phosphates and third it provides a common ion effect okay so this is again the picture okay i put it up there also so that i could explain you what is turbidity so now let's take the reverse condition here okay let's assume your standard solution is your third bottle okay and your sample solution turbidity is that of the first bottle so what will you say about this limit test whether it passes or it fails okay your standard is your third bottle and your sample is your first bottle what do you say whether the limit test will pass or will it fail come on answer the question then only i'll know whether you have understood or not it will pass ma'am it will pass yes ma'am think again standard is your third bottle okay okay your sample or your test is your first bottle it will fail okay. basically what is limit test when we are seeing here for chlorides and sulfates the you are going to compare the turbidity okay your standard will have a fixed turbidity whereas your sample turbidity it may be less than the standard or it may be more than the standard if it is less than the standard then it passes if it is more than the standard then it fails so when i gave you that the third bottle is standard and the first bottle is the sample sample turbidity is more than the standard because of which it will fail okay so this you need to understand when it comes to limit test for chlorides and sulfates we are going to compare the turbidity of both the standard and the sample or test okay if the sample turbidity is less then it passes if the sample turbidity is more then it fails okay so that is what i have explained in this principle as well test passes if turbidity of sample is less than the standard and the test fails if turbidity of sample is more than the standard okay so with this we finish limit test for chlorides and sulfates any doubts please do ask no ma'am no doubts anyone else if you have any questions also to ask please do ask now we have another 3 more minutes no ma'am okay okay then let me take your attendance i think komal jain left no ma'am i'm there you're there in between i think you you had some connection issues you were leaving coming back leaving coming back okay so bb aisha is absent today meghna then ma'am 
प्रजन मैम दिनेश मुत्तुराजा कोमल इज प्रेजेंट यशवंत इज प्रेजेंट सिद्धार्थ गौड़ा सचिन प्रेजेंट मैम पूजा गुजर प्रेजेंट मैम हर्षवर्धन प्रेजेंट मैम प्रेजेंट मैम राइट हर्षवर्धन ऋषा प्रेजेंट मैम प्रशांत प्रेजेंट मैम पूजा देवी पूजा देवी सिंधुश्री प्रेजेंट मैम सिंधुश्री दिस इज आल्सो योर फर्स्ट क्लास राइट यस यस मैम ओके okay then so in tomorrow's class we will look at limit test for iron and if possible we will start with limit test for heavy metals as well okay and uh, see yesterday aisha created the group just for uh, pharma chemistry if any of you are not present in that group then please ask aisha to add your people okay and any doubt any doubts that you have related to this subject you can post it in that group Ma'am, which okay. book should we refer? You can refer Chatwal book for the for uh, as of now. Okay. I'll send you the I'll send you the image in the group. Okay, so once you start coming here, you can start referring the textbook from the library. Okay. Okay then. Okay. See you all tomorrow. Okay, ma'am.